When we dream, the things we know blend in and out of things that aren't, and things that can't be. To the dreamer, it makes little difference. Whatever is in front of you is what's happening. It doesn't need to meet a threshold of coherence or reality to seem vivid and to enable the dreamer to act with rationality in irrational circumstances. Control from Remedy Games is a third-person action title that I only vaguely understood from its marketing material. Some sort of government agency fighting extra-dimensional monsters, something like that. The other thing I'd heard about Control was that it would be best to play it on an extremely powerful new system, and I knew I wouldn't be able to do that for a long while. So I slept on it when it came out. I didn't think it'd be very special, really. I didn't think it would be worth it to play it on my PS4 or my long-suffering laptop. I was wrong. Hugely wrong. While the PS4 version is certainly a little fuzzy and chugs a bit on the base model system, Control is not only one of the most creatively impressive and expressive worlds I've seen in the past couple years, it's also an effort to build on and intensify everything the studio did with Max Payne and Alan Wake in years past. It is the ultimate remedy game. It is also one of the most distinctively unique action games you can buy right now. More than any of that, though, is its ability to truly earn the title dreamlike. Whereas a lot of games are content to just use fog, floating platforms, and revelatory vignettes to suggest a dreamscape, Control seizes upon the logic and pacing of dreams to fashion its entire world. The setup frames it perfectly, and then lets it develop in delightfully bizarre directions. In the old downtown of a dreary, rainy city, there is a skyscraper that no one notices. When you look up at it from the sidewalk, were you able to look up at it, you could not see its top, its brutalist stone edifice reaching skyward into darkness and void. This building is called the Oldest House. It has always been. It will always be. Inside, the space is limitless and touches upon many dimensions, realities, and planes of existence besides our own. It touches, most powerfully, the astral plane, a limitless white void dominated by an inverted black pyramid. The pyramid has voices. It has an agenda. It wants influence. And so, when humans began investigating the oldest house, it hired them. This alien mind, or collection of minds, discovered that humans are awfully useful in their power to organize and bureaucratize the impossible. Within the right frame, the impossible can be seen as mundane. So the beings of the Astral Pyramid began referring to themselves as the Board of Directors, and the Federal Bureau of Control was formed to use the Oldest House to probe trans-dimensional mysteries and keep the wider waking world safe from the things that lurked beside and underneath it, veiled by the separation of realities that sometimes breaks down. The Oldest House's properties of being almost impossible to notice began applying to the Bureau in general. Its purpose? Anonymous. Its budgets? Large, but not noticeably large. Its employees? Cut off from regular society by dimensional fabric and aggressive non-disclosure agreements. What the Bureau's purpose is, its true purpose, is to provide a kind of dull, dry, bureaucratic rationality to the cosmically impossible in hopes of domesticating them through procedure and categorization. In the oldest house, nothing is fixed. The architecture flows like water. It twists and shifts in ways that are magnificently, mesmerizingly inhuman. And in these eldritch halls, we puny humans have arranged an increasingly infinite number of offices, storage closets, research labs, and utility tunnels. The oldest house is a dreamscape in the truest sense, a blend of what is familiar and remembered with what is disconcertingly impossible, taken at the same value without any adequate way to separate one from the other. The foundational concept of the lore is what are called objects of power, comedically abbreviated to OOPs or OOPs. The idea is that the collective unconscious projects millions of versions of objects and ideas into the ether every day, and sometimes those stray energies coalesce into an everyday item with extraordinary, tremendous power. The oldest house is packed floor to ceiling with these objects, some of which you wield as abilities, some of which you merely contain for everyone's safety. Let's use the best example first. Early on, you learn about an OOP in the shape of one of those big old B-drive floppy disks, the kind from the Apple IIe era. I'm just barely old enough for those to have been part of my childhood growing up, but even people too young for that will recognize the disk's basic shape and purpose. It's similar to the save icon still in use, after all, even if that's an A-drive floppy on the technicality. In the original union sense, the collective unconscious is reserved for universal, ancient ideas, images, and motifs, but as an American, I feel it's my duty to water that down into a more casually practical version. The modern world hasn't much existed outside of a few largely overlapping generations, but it's impossible to argue that it hasn't brought with it the most complex global culture to ever exist. While local culture and regional knowledge will always be highly individual, a specialized kind of knowledge, there's a background radiation of mass media and high technology which functions in a universalist way. You can go to the most remote backwater of Siberia, and someone there will have a smartphone, even if it's just a used one they don't pay for service for and only play MP3s off of. The B-Drive disc has been out of circulation for longer than a lot of people watching this video have been alive, but the form of it is somehow familiar, gettable to people still. 
I was born, for example, after 8-tracks were a thing, but I collect them because I find them somehow very charming, as a visibly inferior, clunkier precursor to the equally obsolete cassette tape, itself a miniaturized version of the reel-to-reel -reel format that predates both mobile cassette formats. How does the B-Drive disc work exactly, though? Now it's a mystery. If you show someone an 8-track, they could reasonably guess it was for music because it looks like other cartridge media, but who would guess that inside the plastic case, the tape spools around itself in a 20-minute spiral where four songs are played simultaneously on the loop, and only the position of the reader head determines which of those songs you're actively listening to. I mean, basically nobody, unless you care to look it up. So these objects of power take the form of familiar things, or sort of familiar things, but what they do, how they do it, is given over to mysterious forces from beyond our dimension. The floppy disk is telekinetic. It allows the player to throw increasingly large objects and enemies, eventually allowing the player to rip concrete and marble chunks right out of the wall and hurl them across the room. It is a tremendous power, the game's most useful and visually spectacular. And who's to say a floppy disk can't do this? If the form bubbles up from one part of the dreamscape, who's to say the function can't bubble up from a completely different one? The first object of power you find, the service weapon, works the opposite way. Its function determines its form. Its form is really indeterminate. The Astral Pyramid describes it as an, an Excalibur, the will to defend yourself manifesting in as pure a way as it can. Had your symbolic reference for defense been a sword and a shield, it would have been a sword and a shield. But this is the Federal Bureau of Control, and so it takes the form of a service revolver. And other weapons. As your power grows, you can visualize it into increasingly abstract forms that serve the function of other categories of weapon. It remains a sidearm, but can adapt into the firing patterns of a shotgun, machine gun, distance rifle, and eventually a grenade launcher. You flip between two of these forms with ease, and then configure your chosen two at any time through the menu. What it is, what it looks like, stems from your desire and will to use it that way. In a dream, I often find that I'll forget a detail, and when I try to remember that detail, it pops back in differently. I'm aware of the difference somehow, but committed to going along because the path forward through a dream is always to simply accept and keep moving. Mechanically, the service weapon is any gun I want. Existentially, this is also true. The object itself is not really any one gun, but simply an extension of my intention to shoot the targets and be triumphant. This is what I mean by the whole game running on dream logic. You can't even get out of the inventory screen without having to interact through it in some way. So what's the most frightening thing to a dreamer? It's not necessarily the stuff of nightmares. Nightmare scenarios, creatures, and anxieties all come from within, so there's value in confronting them. There's a thousand horror movies about the cathartic value of challenging what you're afraid of, putting a face or a name to the formless fear that often becomes part of the fabric of everyday life. Nightmares are never welcome, but often valuable. A dream is, above all, personal. Suppose, though, something were to invade your dream and erase all that, to corrupt everything it touches and force you to experience its own foul song played so loudly it drowns out anything else. To then be trapped in someone else's dream, not just someone, but something, something oily, hungry, limitless. Now that is dangerous. This, in-game, is called The Hiss. In the distant, gurgling speech of the board of directors, The Hiss is attempting a hostile takeover of the oldest house, and through it, the Black Astral Pyramid. It is winning. The hiss is an entity, but it's also a sound, and kind of like a liquid, and absolutely a kind of resonant, fluctuating haze. It's odd enough to feel convincingly transdimensional. I absolutely believe it to be part of a frightening other place and not from anywhere local. In the game, though, the hiss is only frightening in a thematic, conceptual way. I love the hiss as a narrative antagonist. As a mechanical antagonist, though, the hiss is the most truly basic and straightforward thing in the game. It possesses people, sometimes shaping them into monsters, but more often than not just leaving them as different varieties of heavily armed people under the influence of a red glow. Here's where control gets especially interesting, though. By rejecting some kind of extra paranormal mechanic, like the shadow shields in Alan Wake where you had to burn them off with a flashlight, instead focusing on enemies behaving predictably as a group and responding to them as a composite threat, you end up with a game that feels closer to the original two Max Payne titles than anything that Remedy's done since then. The whole mechanical design is an essentially retro experience, just refined and perfected using all the lessons the developer has learned in the past two decades. The most important aspect of that game feel is its total rejection of cover mechanics. Not only do franchises like Gears of War rely on cover mechanics, but so do most of the many, many open-world Ubisofts, from Tom Clancy games to Watch Dogs to whatever. Third-person action and cover-based combat pacing are so ubiquitous that it's almost a given that a game will play that way if it's a third-person perspective. Max Payne always felt so different because it forced a player to be, instead, acrobatically aggressive. You needed to dive in, picking off targets in slow motion, to get around them and behind them, or cut through them like butter with your ability-enhanced reflexes. 
Max Payne games were also very difficult. Every enemy could kill you if caught unaware. Control replaces the time dilation effect with a selection of supernatural abilities, like the throw I mentioned, but also including a defensive shield, a possession ability, and the ability to levitate during combat. Like Max Payne, using level architecture like chokeholds and blind is, are, is key. There is cover to be had if you want to take it, but you're completely denied the ability to hide behind a box and kill everyone without moving. Enemy density and variety increases as your powers do, and there is no variable difficulty. The power curve is balanced to one particular range where it feels just about perfect. That constantly increasing pressure and sometimes overwhelming volume of enemies forces you to play it the Max Payne way, eliminating danger with a highly reactive, aggressive dexterity instead of a tactical plodding advancement from arena to arena. Cover-based shooters are always, in a way, comfortable. You'll be okay if you're careful. In Max Payne, and really even more so in Control, the best strategy is often the riskiest. Care is less important than building lethal momentum. Doom 2016's mechanics were all about that, but Control makes, makes both you and the enemies much more fragile than Doom Guy and the Demon Crew. It's not about health management the same way. The only other game Control truly feels like is Max Payne. It's a very particular, very unusual balance and pacing. And it's not just the mechanical design that resonates that way. The whole visual spectacle of combat and what control means to the gaming industry right now is reminiscent of exactly what the first two Max Paynes represented in their own release windows back in the day. Control is a system hog. There are a lot of videos on the technical methods that the game uses to render on high-end graphics cards, but I played it at what feels like minimum settings on the base model PS4. If you could turn up all of everything within the game, you're treated to a factory showroom of reflection and refraction way beyond what's widely available or seen in this footage. Control's reputation as a window to the future of high-end rendering techniques nearly made me pass it by and write it off. If I'm not gonna upgrade right now, what's the point of playing until I do? Won't I miss the main selling point of the experience? It was only a sale price on the PS4 version that got me to change my mind. I pretty much immediately realized I had made a mistake, however, and that the game was much, much more than a room perfectly reflected in a drinking glass. The greatest visual thrill isn't in the details so much as it's in the chaos. The oldest house and environs are hugely destructible, with almost every kind of furniture and building material disintegrating in its own special way. I remember the excitement that the original Max Payne caused in magazines like PC Gamer because of the detailed combat reactivity. Look at all these papers blow around, all these sparks, these puffs of concrete dust where the bullets impact. Even replaying the Max Payne games today, it's the living chaos that flows from the very specific player-driven shape combat takes which makes them feel so mechanically satisfying. Otherwise, those barren urban and industrial corridors would seem stale. Its slow motion mechanics allowed a tactical utility to double as a way to especially highlight the environment's destructibility. Fast forward a few years, and Monolith's Fear is doing almost exactly the same thing, but from a first-person horror perspective. On release, Fear was another game which pioneered some very demanding graphical flourishes and prompted its audience to upgrade their systems to really appreciate it. Its combat was slow motion, highly reactive chaos, and exactly as satisfying a way as Max Payne was. The choice environments is exactly the same too, either an empty and depopulated urban environment, or a corporate environment, or an industrial environment. All of them kind of sparse, in a certain readily identifiable way. The environments are comparatively undetailed because the game needs to save its rendering power for its at-will effects and not blow it all on baroquely textured rooms and hallways. The spartan anonymity of a concrete corridor or a mundane office setting personalizes itself to hilariously extreme degrees once the fighting starts. Bullets riddling the walls, desks shot in half or overturned, papers exploding out of filing cabinets into a carpet on the floor. I had mostly thought this sort of design, where you take a kind of flat background and then allow the player to paint their own picture of destruction over it, was kind of a thing of the past. But here Control is, making me feel like it's 2005 all over again. The way combat feels, the way combat looks, the way the environments have been engineered to make that combat as chaotic as possible against their comparative blankness, it's such a willful throwback to a branch of the big shooter family tree that long ago, I thought, had atrophied. It's also what makes Control feel so utterly distinctive as an action game. It's got all the polish and skill of a modern release, with the risk-taking, carefully considered ambition of something from a much more creatively competitive era. 
The physics calculations had worked when you pull chunks of concrete out of the walls and hurl them at your enemies, bowling them over like pins, who then knock over more enemies, and tables, and chairs, and sparking computer banks, and a stray fire extinguisher, which then starts spraying its foam aimlessly and twirling on the ground, while also coordinating ten other enemies in a flank maneuver at the same time, is enough to set the PS4 to stuttering. The game really is designed for more powerful hardware than this. Control's saving grace is that its design isn't strictly dependent on the smoothness of its combat. Any fight is a bright burst of gorgeous chaos against environments that start out as almost oppressively ordered. Max Payne used its war warehouses and seedy hotels to make Max feel alone and hunted in a gross, predatory world. Fear used its offices and laboratories to ironically, disconcertingly contrast the eruptions of violence, blood, and supernatural doom that build and build over the game's length. Control's blend of brutalism, bureaucracy, and physics-defying impossibilities makes the mundane seem fragile and suspect. It enhances and encourages a paranoid feeling. It's not just that these kind of bland, blank rooms and corridors are purely blank. Each of these three games leverages that blankness into something thematically resonant, something that takes the joy of combat and flavors it with a wonderful anxiety. Fear was a horror game through and through. That's what it explicitly set out to be. Control is so similar on a lot of superficial or mechanical metrics. Is it also, then, a horror game? Why would one game about a government organization tasked with dealing with supernatural threats utilizing minimalist environments and highly reactive combat hew to its most obvious genre, while another would not? Answering that question means delving into what makes the tone and setting of Control so delicately unique. I think in the hands of almost any other studio, it would be a horror game. All the hallmarks are there. The foundational conflict between the Hiss and the Black Pyramid, the sinister parts of the Bureau's mission and facilities, the monsters from other dimensions, and the twisted forms of the Hiss-possessed enemies. Surely, all that's horror. Certainly a great deal of it is creepy. Especially the chanting. There's a long, looping refrain that pours through the minds and out the mouths of the possessed from time to time, and it's as wonderfully unsettling as anything in Alan Wake. The Hiss is frankly, a more horrifying enemy than the Shadow Men of Alan Wake, and the visual horror at play in Control is often more intense than Alan Wake was willing to get, except in maybe the DLC. Yet, Alan Wake was trying to be horror. It had a fallible, unreliable protagonist beset by demons essentially of his own making. It closely followed a very particular Stephen Kingish vibe. Control's setting doesn't have that horror frame, despite the horrific presentation of some of its elements. It's not horror for the same reason The X-Files isn't horror. Beyond any sci-fi explanation of paranormal phenomenon, it's about finding out and chasing a truth through a bewildering world of contradictions and impossibilities. Horror is a whole mood, but its foundation is in vulnerability, cultivating an atmosphere where the viewer, reader, or player feels tension or dread in the background of nearly everything, and the big answers feel threatening to the point of knowing you're better off leaving well enough alone. Revelations are usually fatal in horror, or at minimum, carry a mortal danger. The primary driver in the X-Files, and Control, is curiosity. Mulder and Jesse share an almost pathological need to know, and a total lack of a life outside of the present quest for knowledge. Horror protagonists typically have something to lose, some kind of normal to go back to, or at least yearn towards. Not Fox Mulder or Jesse Faden. For these types, there's no normal to go back to after, as Jesse puts it in the very beginning of the game, seeing what's on the other side of the poster on the wall. That willingness to completely commit to diving in deeper and deeper, to accepting whatever you find there, is contradictory to a true atmosphere of horror. Especially in the many side quests you'll find around the oldest house, there's a sense of irony, fun, and joy in the unknown that disqualifies it from being horror, but frees it to be something odder, more individual than that. The best example I can give is one of the best side bosses, of many, a haunted refrigerator. On your way to do a main quest, you find a man calling for help from inside one of the OOP containment chambers. His job is to watch over this object of power at all times, or to let some kind of terrible power escape. His shift was supposed to end 16 hours ago. He's starting to go crazy. You actually cannot help him immediately. You have to come back after you attend to your primary business. This pause is key, because it builds low-key sympathy for the poor schmuck the entire time. He lasts all the way until you're in the next room with him, when the fridge, out of view, lashes out and pulls him in. It's an old 50s model, with magnet drawings and now bloodstains. When you reach out to touch it, it pulls you into a darkened, forgotten part of the astral plane, where a colossal one-eyed creature attempts to murder you. There is 
no part of this that isn't presented as exciting. The fridge doesn't evoke dread so much as the danger being real as a kind of darkly comic twist on an absurdist tableau, the low-level clerk staring unblinking for hours on end at an extremely boring appliance that aims to kill him. It's not horror for the same reason the metamorphosis isn't horror just because the guy wakes up as a cockroach. The absurdism here is serving a larger purpose and making a broader point than the initial reaction. The lengthy boss fight at the end shows that Control never strays too far from being an action video game, but the kind of wild setups and surrealist imagery it's constantly throwing at you shows it never limited itself to the minimum of what was necessary to be fun and mechanically satisfying. Yet fun is what comes through, much more than fear. This isn't a failure to be scary, it's a stylistic choice to veer towards something different. It's not uncommon to compare Control's oldest house to the house of the Navidsen record in Mark Z. Danielski's House of Leaves. They are both inhumanly hostile places that are larger on the inside than they are on the outside, both react to the minds within it, and both have indescribably, uncomfortably large potential proportions. You could fall for miles within those houses. Except House of Leaves features a chapter that includes a blue box listing all the things the Navidsen house doesn't have, which is basically an exhaustive list of everything that's ever been in a house, except the most basic concepts of stairs and doors and such. The Navidsen Records house is a swallowing void, frightening in its emptiness. The oldest house is defined instead by its objects and its occupants. There's a whole sealed wing of the bureau full of clocks because there's some kind of beast from another dimension that vomits great gobs of them, and they drift from room to room like gigantic grains of sand. The board of directors is mysterious and not necessarily benevolent, but they're proven to have been broadly tolerant of human meddling and exploration so far. It's arguable whether House of Leaves is itself a horror novel, especially depending on who you think the true voice of the passages is, or if you accept the multiple viewpoints as valid, but there's no doubt that great swaths of the Navidsen record passages were intended to convey horror and function as horror. There's chapters that I found more legitimately frightening than the whole of many more traditional horror novels. The Navidsen house is, whatever else the book is, a haunted house. The oldest house of control is not. It simply has an unwelcome guest. In fact, one of the more narratively satisfying flourishes is how comfortable in the chaos Jesse becomes. At the beginning, when you go through the tutorial for the service revolver that also introduces the astral plane, it offers that Jesse is the chosen one, and thusly the story's protagonist, but only if she chooses to be chosen. Everything that happens is born of an active desire to see what's next, and not having the unknown to send down unwillingly. About halfway through, you come to a seemingly optional area called the Ashtray Maze. It's like a kind of luxurious apartment building where the hallways shift around and close you off, corralling you back towards the start, no matter how deep into the maze you try to get. There's a number of optional chests in here this early in the game, so exploration is rewarded, but success is impossible. It's actually, structurally, the gateway to the semi-final boss fight. You're meant to come back and navigate it at the height of Jesse's powers. This is important for the tone, because once this thing unlocks, it isn't a maze in the traditional sense, so much as an architectural kaleidoscope you have to pass through one lens of and slowly work your way towards the other end to escape. The direction is never uncertain, it's always forward, but forward into what is a mesmerizingly slippery question in the ashtray maze. First of all, overriding everything, this sequence is soundtracked by a hard rock banger called Take Control by Poets of the Fall. The pace of the maze is matched to the song. It's fast, it escalates quickly, and it is relentlessly exuberant. At your full, boulder-throwing, levitating, high-level best, this place doesn't have to be, and should not be, scary. This is who Jessie was meant to be, and where she was meant to be. She was always somehow headed to this climactic moment as the Bureau's director, the one who pulled the sword from the stone and set out on the quest. The game's combat balance is tilted temporarily in your favor so that you'll be encouraged to go quickly, aggressively, in pace with the music, and without being interrupted by death and loading screens. The final boss fights are necessarily a major part of the mechanical climax, though not in this case the only part, but the ashtray maze is the aesthetic climax of the whole game. This is the culmination of the mood that the oldest house was trying to cultivate. Not horror, not apprehension, a limitless unknown that dances and shimmers as you dive down into it, full of noise and color and movement, and entirely the opposite in every way from the Navidsen house. In a nightmare, you are falling. In a dream, you are flying. Although your player character is extremely mechanically fragile for much of the game, there is little of the sense of vulnerability that horror games try to cultivate. The combat feels, in general, either fair or stacked in your favor, with the exception of boss fights. Sometimes these boss fights are randomly generated, an especially large or powerful enemy in one of the respawning groups you meet when you're backtracking. Sometimes they're tied to the story and to primary progression. 
Most often and most impressively, though, they climax the many side quests on offer throughout the various floors of the oldest house. They're all so good that I kept trying until I had felled all but one, which I gave up on entirely after like 20 botched attempts. I'm just not very good at action games. I'm slow, I'm clumsy, I absolutely never remember to block, and Control killed me what's probably hundreds of times. The thing is, I actually kept at it quite happily. Control has a fixed difficulty, which I hated for a while, but eventually came to accept because of the tuning of the power curve is smoother in the end game than most any of its peers, and I don't think it would have been as tightly designed that way if it had to accommodate a range of difficulties. It is what it is. It plays how it plays. With the exception of the fight I gave up on, it never felt unfair. I always felt like perseverance would pay off. This is hard to cultivate in a diehard Butterfingers player like me. I find myself largely unmotivated or demotivated by having to replay a section of something over and over again. There was a bit of a susurrus on Twitter a while back when ultra-popular Twitch personality Tyler Blevins wrote, quote, The phrase, it's just a game, is such a weak mindset. You're okay with what happened. Losing. Imperfection of a craft. When you stop getting angry after losing, you have lost twice. There's always something to learn, and always room for improvement. Never settle. End quote. While a lot of people called him out for being a horse's ass in this statement, I found it, in addition, to be kind of an interesting window into the way some other people see win and loss states. Speaking personally, I don't get angry at all unless I have to do something over five times in a row or else repeat greater than ten minutes of content in a go. If it goes over those thresholds, I don't really get pissed, I just feel kind of empty and disconnected because I feel like I've been wasting my time. Because the thing is, it is just a game. The skills required to master a game are not broadly transferable, even if it feels to folks like Blevins to be reflective of your interior character or that committing to getting better at the game represents a desire to better yourself. This is illusory. Time spent perfecting your mastery of the game is time spent perfecting your mastery of that game alone. It is not time spent on a million other choices that could occupy your finite minutes on this earth. Blevins is linking his own self-worth to the game, that a lost state says he could have tried harder, that it has an implicit mandate that he must try harder. For me, a lost state tells me that I was careless about something, so I try to pay closer attention, and then if that doesn't work, it occurs to me that there's like a half dozen books and three dozen movies that I could also give my attention to without even physically moving more than five feet. I don't really think in terms of winning or losing so much as progression. If I feel like I'm moving forward, even if that involves a lot of deaths, that's winning enough. If I'm stuck in one place without understanding what I'm even doing wrong, or worse, understanding perfectly or not being fast or coordinated enough to manage what's being asked, then this is losing and I'm just not here for it. I find it profoundly demotivational to reach that point. Control surprised the hell out of me for pushing me willingly past the point where I would have otherwise abandoned a playthrough of a different sort of action game. Part of that is effective, forgiving checkpointing. A larger part is truly fair combat balancing, where everyone is equally lethal to each other. A smaller, but perhaps more important part, is being able to approach the truly difficult fights in a non-linear order, and to be checkpointed far back enough to abandon the attempt and try again later when failure becomes aggressively monotonous. I could always choose to do something else when it came to these bosses. I could choose to be chosen, and I could also choose to just walk the main story out a few more paces and see something amazing in the process. They'd be there when I was rested. Not just rested, but more mechanically powerful besides. When I learned Control didn't have an adjustable difficulty, I thought that was going to be a major issue between me and the game. Despite some frustrating moments, it never really was. It's an enormous credit to this game's balance that it got me to leave my comfort zone so completely on the difficulty front. Pivoting back to the main plot is actually a wonderful palate cleanser for the exploratory combat because it's very fast-moving and tight. Control's primary loops are buttressed by some appropriately strange character work, of whom your player character is the strangest. Jesse and her brother, in a long-ago, half-remembered past, were living in a small town called Ordinary. It was there they found a slide projector where every one of its slides projected not an image, but a door. On the other side was something terrible, something that had been waiting a long time. The Bureau took Dylan, their brother, and the slide projector along with it. They left Jesse alone to see what she'd do. A control group, if you would. Jesse and Dylan made contact with something over there, something they always assumed was benevolent, but the slide projector's realms are where the hiss poured from as well. The entity in her head she calls Polaris and the hiss are similar in many ways. What's their true agenda? Can Jesse trust herself? Structurally, Polaris is kind of a handy little storytelling device because Jesse's one-sided conversations with the entity double his conversations with the player, and her pleas for help from the entity fit nicely into the player's role in guiding her path and keeping her alive. 
Still, Jessie is far from an every woman sort of character. She's bright and witty in a lot of ways, but there's something kind of cold and sinister that comes through from time to time. Not often. There's a sense that underneath the person who she sees herself as, there's someone very dangerous lurking there. It makes her stepping so comfortably into the violent, mind-bending role of the bureau director feel both natural and disconcerting. Her personality lends its own power to the pervasive atmosphere of paranoia and fungible reality. Dylan, her brother, has been groomed by the agency for the role of director, to the point that some of the scientists made a children's show just for him to explain the Bureau's processes and responsibilities, a show you can occasionally find episodes of called Threshold Kids. Like Address Unknown and Max Payne and Night Springs and Alan Wake, it's a TV show so utterly bizarre and creepy it pulls the broader atmosphere sideways along with it. Address Unknown and Night Springs always parallel the protagonist's path in some way, but Threshold Kids is a little different. It's made for an audience of one, the poor kid whose life never recovered from an encounter with the other side. It's difficult to imagine that a kid who grew up with this sort of tone-deaf, existentially terrifying edutainment growing up well-adjusted, and Dylan, decidedly, did not. The hiss has taken him by the time you find him, and there's a melancholy feeling that Jesse had failed him long before that, and there isn't a lot of making up for it. Dylan is a dark reflection of what Jesse could be if she slips into the current of the unknown where it's running so fast as to carry her away and drown. The joy and thrill of power and mayhem in the combat is narratively tempered with this vivid, personal example of how Jesse could lose herself in it. Dylan's only crime, after all, was using the same powers that Jesse wields without the justifications Jesse has for using them. Control skillfully develops Jesse and Dylan by interweaving sympathy with suspicion. The Threshold Kids is, is great especially for highlighting how weird the oldest house is by attempting to make cosmological horror palatable for kids. It's better, though, for the window into how that strangeness can bleed over into Dylan and into Jesse and alter what it finds there. After all, mirrors are more fun than television. The game lightly pretends to end with Jesse being taken over by the hiss in a wonderfully bleak little climax to the endurance fight waiting for you beyond the ashtray maze. The credits roll, but it's not long before the names and design roles become the repeating pattern of the hiss chant, then the credits themselves degrade into a sloppy nothingness. Jesse then finds herself not as the director of the Bureau of Control, but as a lowly clerk. You have three tasks. Make copies, collect dirty coffee mugs, and deliver a huge stack of mail. These tasks are infinite. If you finish one, they will simply reappear. I even tried to bump up to the exact threshold of each task and accomplish all three at the same time to see what that would do, but no, it's a gray-tinged nightmare of perpetual, meaningless bureaucracy, no matter what. The only thing that breaks the monotony is, after some toiling, a vacuum-sealed message to the director will appear. This cycle continues three times over, with Jesse finding herself more and more able to reject the busy work and remember something important, something about who the director is. What I love about this particular nightmare is how the goal isn't waking up. It's taking control. That's even the title of the final mission altogether. There's nothing to return to back out in the rainy, car-lined streets of the city. Everything that's anything to Jessie is here in the oldest house, in her newfound powers, inside the dream. What's intolerable is having that dream dictated to her. There's another dreamer in the oldest house, as powerful or more than Jesse, and he serves as a kind of model of what benevolent stewardship of all this cosmic weirdness might look like. Ati the janitor. He's the first person that Jesse meets, and he tells her, auspiciously, that the job she'll be applying for is his assistant. While you do side quests to help Adi later on if you want, that isn't really what he's talking about. Adi is the one who allows you to navigate the ashtray maze, but only after finding him on vacation, where he's turned the, the very foundation of the oldest house into a beach that's not really there. Maybe it's real for Adi, but to Jesse and the player it appears almost gaseous. There's memos you can even find telling employees to just let Adi do his thing, no matter the clearance level of the area he's in. Even within the bureaucracy of the Bureau, he operates on dream logic in every action. Adi's job is to maintain the oldest house, in a cosmic sense. The director may be important, they may have power here, but they're really just Adi's assistant. The hiss is an undesirably messy tenant. They are predatory, consuming, and utterly incurious. Humans, on the other hand, alter the very shape of the house with their collective imagination. The battle here may have involved magic and bullets and magic bullets, but it's fundamentally a contest of wills between the human animal and a malicious frequency from beyond the veil. The real climax, leading to the true credits roll, is a journey across the now hiss-corrupted astral plane to save her brother, to cleanse him like she'd cleansed objects all game long. It's a strong choice to end it on this personal note, I think. Dylan had seemed like such a lost cause, and that caused her so much regret. If she was going to change anything with her powers, it would certainly be that.
She came for her brother from the very beginning, after all. It's not a traditional rescue, but it's a traditional enough story beat to play very strongly without any complications from the twisty lore and sometimes hard-to-parse world-building. It is the perfect cap on top of what's really a cumulative climax, first aesthetically in the ashtray maze, then psychologically for Jessie when she takes control of her nightmare, then mechanically in the brutal war of attrition across the crimson-tainted astral plane, and finally, narratively, when Jessie fulfills the goal she stepped into the oldest house to accomplish. Control has the unusual feeling of being both thoroughly complete within what it intended to do and extremely open-ended in what it could do from here. Remedy has said that control could be the foundation for many games to come because the effective infinity of the oldest house has near unlimited storytelling potential. Starting from this game as a foundation, they already have an aesthetic, a cast of characters, and a deep well of compelling lore to draw from. Control is one of the most exciting games I've played in a while, not just in the playing of it, but in the feeling of having seen something with the potential to be even more than it was. It's rare for me to find a game I connected to so immediately and so completely, rarer still for it to be a game I'd ordinarily consider beyond my skill level. Control isn't ordinary about anything. It's the culmination of years of Remedy's other creative choices, pointing the way towards not something stale, but towards something reassuringly familiar in the mechanics and vibrantly new in the presentation. Control is a waking dream that happens to play like an extremely quality third-person shooter. The images of that dream struck me so powerfully that even now they whisper, images of concrete that flows like water and manila folders full of forbidden knowledge. When I dream my own dreams, the oldest house is there too now. Can't really think of a much higher compliment than that. Thanks for watching. I'd like to take a moment to thank by name some of the people who are currently donating $10 a month or more through the crowdfunding website Patreon. People like Kale Perrion, Comfy Hat, Alex Hansen, Leo Neal, Ethan Cossett, John Paul Queller, Aaron Williams, Andrew Hartman, Zach Millington, Soab Sheik, Eddie Burton, Carol Henderson, Daniel Phillips, Tyler Robinson, Jeremy McQuaid, Corey Bofill, Eli Bergmas, Dennis Clark, Jake Mays, Kumarin Vision, Nobody, World War II Freak, Alexander Leister, Igor Babiak, Lars Bracken, Morgan Mall, Ryan Hill, Julian Reno, Agendine, Jared Meyer, Jeno Shin, Stinson Sneed, Notem, Adam Alla, ICR7, Thomas Culligan, Ali Nuortimo, Brian Barrow, Sidonia, Massive Ron, Ron Gervais, James Condon, Gray, Chris Tekenton, Evan Eggers, Peori, Horori, Vodka Blitz, Kirk Battle, Johnny Marsbar, Rusty Kelly, Jason Hyde, Jeff Sang, Jason, Stephen Plovan, Eric Goods, Levi Thomas, Heast Guy, Hedgehog Kevin, Sean Sovey, Doom Sheridan, Jeremy Austin, Cody Patterson, Sophia Naylor, Alexander Smith, Konstantin Ivanov, Ali Hamoud, Franz Lavka, Devona Oparak, Jed Kirk, Logan Hickman, Danston, Tyson Cox, JRG123, Liam White, Zachary Leonard Roper, Wolf in White Van, Sergeant QQ, Trinant, Penny Drake, Matthew Burns, Symmetry Master, 1MXW1, Aaron Dembski Budin, Matthias Campbell, Rogue Frax, Keone Warby, Eli Youngs, Space Wizard 63, Arnie HD, Evie, Maxwell Bone, Thomas Vavasur, Emma vs. Dracula, Peter Gronbach, Jake Calder, Tyler R. Smith, Alex McDonald, Ryan Park, Christopher Guile, Kevin Morris, Allison Sugar, Brianna Manasa, Mario Mendez, Dave, Alexander Clatworthy, Vadim Flax, Kyle Zimes, Colin Stoltz, Nicholas, Quinn, Cool Boy John, Atavio Albanese, Ethan Hayes, Howard Knudsen, Quinn Hannah White, Carew Hogue, Peter H., Reese Kittleson, John Little, Scrub Lord, Darren Jackson, Eric Jensen, Phil Harding, Elijah King, Baxter Jr., Max Barros, Patrick Galmond, Tyrone, Tyrone Lambert, Gabriel Holland, Simon Hasselow, Patrick Mills, Miesko Yaha, Callum Tien, Ben Gelbert, Drolix789, Deeb, Highland Fox, Well Tempered Clavier, William Pavard, Quainen, Matthew Shryrock, Dragon Cobalt, Ricky Shields, Asborn Volk Falman, Owen Tierla, Cold Beans, Bob Mitchum, Tyler King, Mike W., Stephen Lovedance, Benjamin, Ivan Ekaveria, Selavik, Cobra, Adam N.H., Histoclop, 
Travis Houston, Alex Williams, William J. Gorman, Marky Marcus Aurelius, Leighton Carden, James Henderson, Zachary Zienba, Juju Beans, John Seklovsky, Matthew Richard Teubner, Austin Matheson, Scott Muck, S.G. Response, Tiernan Garces, Christopher Askin, James Gray, Vitor Tumoli, Derek Melancon, Jared A. Hicks, Garrett Johnson, Han Ping, Jacob Wanich, Valerian, Psychedelicat, Max Cohen, Shieldwall, Leo Peril, Markaleth, Tyler F., Piper Man, William Tong, Conceited Alice, Conceited Axis, Bryn Davis, Lawrence Hurley, James Mosca, Simon Anderson, Victor Felton, S. Engvall, Jeffrey McIntyre, Marcin Zerad, Zachary Berent, Levi Whitney, Dakian Delomast, Mr. Mush, Nikolai, Elijah Nelson, Sam Belmeyer, Byron Callan, Colin Guti, Erica Munson, Noah Kentrowitz, Tinfoil Pancakes, Max Pantoja, Maurice Desero, Manu Weedman, Lo Beyonder, Gilosen, Vance Jordan Falls, Ralph Rainwater, Alexander Romanov, Piotr Kasperzik, Patrick McGranahan, Robot Ghost, Jeremy Saunders, Stephen Heim, Ryan Snyder, April, Jacob McMillan, Eric Joyner, Edward Clayton Andrews, Tim Dobbs, Ian Glasscock, Dylan Ball, C.E. Keen, Mr. Pigeon, L. Weasel, Werner, Her Werner Herzog, Connor McLeod, Daniel Orn Christensen, Thomas Lee, me, Nemo Vandenberg, The Nick of Odds, Ben Weller, J.S., Nick, Greg Merlis, Jordan Klein, Sky Jansen, Daniel Floyd, Mark Phillips, Andrew Tapp, Kevin Schaub, Matthew Sutton, Kaiser the Carrion, David Carlson, Kissa, David Hardstrike, Matthew Mason, Josh, Obelisk Arch Art History, Matthew Cassidy, Will Dobbins, Tom Rowerdink, Kyle Zayner, N.K. Jemison, Michael Atwell, Andrew Opplinger, I Cannot Fly, Dirk Warbrill, Nick Cole Hamilton, Galak, Brett Guillermo, Oscar Stangenberg, Lars Ingvar Anderson, Colin, Adam Howard, Dewey, Aurelian, Andrew Boissino, Pascal Murray, Alexander Sundin, Zach B., Lassilus, Toad Hart, Thomas Witte, Casey Pioli, Hercules Johnson, The Soul James, Fergus Foley, Argus Swift, Ryan Van Dyke, Daniel Barsh, Saibot D., <sighs> Kim Winson, Andreas Larson, Anthony Bardell, Sean, Philip Coffey, Ryan Plockelman, Jesse Wilkinson, Devin Fitzpatrick, Tim Marsh, Colin Bassnet, Jeanette N., Carl Gleason, Spooky Space Cook, Dios, Rich Stower, Adrian Komalek, Nate Tenzar, Tom Peter, Simon Nierfalk, Sharif Kazemi, Jared Olszewski, Mr. Flacco, Eric Jepson, Dirk Warburg, Q. Ray X, Alex Zalato, The Bloke, Brandon Boat, Stephen, Stephen Garrett Day, Sasha Iya, Peter Flink, You Are a Worm Through Time, The Thunder Song Distorts You, Happiness Comes, White Pearls But Yellow and Red in the Eye, Through a Mirror, Inverted is Made Right. Leave your insides by the door. Push the fingers through the surface into the wet. You've always been the new you. We wait in the stains. The word that describes this is redacted. Repeat the word. The egg cracks. The truth will emerge out of you. Krimgi Schlepaps. And everyone else who donates a lesser amount through the website Patreon. It's you guys who keep these videos going. Thank you.